In the summer of 1303, King Edward I of England was in Scotland on campaign when a courier arrived with some shocking news. Tens of thousands of pounds worth of silver and gold had been stolen from the royal treasury from what was believed to be the most secure room in the whole of England. In 1303, Edward I, so tall that he was known as Edward Longshanks, had ruled for 31 years. He conquered and seized control of Wales, and fought a war with France over his holdings on the continent called the Gascon War, but peace with France in 1303 had allowed him to focus his attention north, as Scotland had rebelled in what would much later be called the First War for Scottish Independence. The website History Things Explains, with tongue-in-cheek, a former Scottish knight named William Wallace, played by Mel Gibson, had raised resistance in Scotland. Edward returned to fight Wallace's rebellion, a fight that kept Edward away for long periods of time. But while those two were up north making Braveheart, the plot that was developing back in London was much more like Ocean's Eleven. The church known today as Westminster Abbey began as a Benedictine monastery that was in existence at least by the middle of the 10th century. The monastery was greatly expanded in the 11th century, including a stone church under the patronage of the Anglo-Saxon king Edward the Confessor, namesake of Edward Longshanks. The website of the Abbey explains that this church became known as the Westminster to distinguish it from St. Paul's Cathedral, the Eastminster in the city of London. Since 1066, the Abbey has been the location where English monarchs are crowned. The cathedral and monastery had been expanded under both Henry III and his son Edward Longshanks, but one of the oldest parts of the castle, original to the time of Edward the Confessor, is the Pix Chamber. The website of Westminster Abbey explains that the low vaulted room off the east cloister is part of the Undercroft, underneath the monk's dormitory, which was built around 1070. The term Pix refers to a small round box. Pixes are often used in churches to hold the Eucharist, but that is not how the chamber got its name. In this case, Pix referred to a round container used to hold coins. The Royal Mint Museum writes that since at least 1282, coins produced by the Royal Mint have been independently checked in a proceeding known as the Trial of the Picks, which takes its name from the Picks, or box in which were kept the sample coins set aside for testing. The point of the trials is to independently check the coinage to ensure the coins contain the proper amount of precious metals. The master of the mint was required to set aside one coin per 10 pounds of silver. The coins would then be melted down and tested under the supervision of the Baron of the Exchequer. The chamber was called the Pix Chamber because the boxes of coins to be tested were taken and stored here at a stone table in the back of the chamber, sometimes mistaken as an altar, was used to do the testing. Edward I had reformed coinage to create a more reliable currency and rules for the trial to be done every three months were established likely in 1279. The trial of the Pix, though more ceremonial in purpose, continues today. It is likely because the room was used to hold the coinage that it also came to be used to hold the treasury. The website of Westminster Abbey writes, the chamber was walled off in the 12th century and made into a treasury in the 13th century. In his 2005 book, The Great Crown Jewels Robbery of 1303, historian Paul Doherty writes that the crypt of Westminster was a treasure house, housing most of the royal regalia of the crown of England, as well as jewels, silver, and gold coins, goblets, jugs, chalices, cups, saucers, spoons, vases, not to mention unique treasures. The king had reason to house his valuables there. The website On London explains that with its 13-foot-thick walls, it had long been considered the most secure room in the whole of the kingdom. It had two heavy oak doors, one behind the other, each with three locks, meaning six keys were required to gain admittance. Doherty explains that the keys to the treasure were held in secured, sealed pouches by senior officials at the king's wardrobe. The Benedictine monks at the abbey were dedicated to their vows. The king, who might have had to use the jewels as collateral to borrow money, if need be, to fund his war in Scotland, would have had reason to trust that they were well protected in the crypt at Westminster. But there was an issue. In his 1916 book, A Medieval Robbery, Thomas Frederick Tout writes that Edward had moved most of the government north to be more convenient to him while he conducted his fight against the Scots. While the king was only for the first time able to dedicate most of his efforts against the Scots owing to the recent peace with France, the war had been going since 1296. By 1303, Tout notes, the king, court, and government offices had been moved to York for over five years. In his 1873 work, A History of Crime in England, Luke Owen Pike, a historical researcher at the United Kingdom's Public Record Office, writes that in the king's absence, there was no bodyguard at the palace. Every soldier that could be spared was in active service in the field. 
This made for poor security. Tout notes, under medieval conditions, the eye of a vigilant taskmaster was an essential condition of efficiency. It followed that during Edward's long absence, things at Westminster were allowed to drift into an extraordinary state of confusion and disorder. The keeper of the castle at Westminster, John Sanch, had not even been appointed by Edward, but was instead an inherited position. With the king in court away, Tout estimates that Sench and his underling, William, became less than responsible. Soon John and William, in the absence of the higher authorities, seemed to have gathered together a band of disreputable boon companions of both sexes, whose drunken revels and scandalous misconduct was soon notorious throughout the neighborhood. One element in this band of revelers was, I regret to say, a certain section of the monks of the neighboring monastery. For as the absence of the king and the court had left the palace asleep, as it were, so also had the monastery at Westminster sunk into a deeper and more scandalous slumber. The abbot, Walter of Wenlock, Tout writes, was an old man whose hold on the monks was slight. It followed, Tout writes, naturally that many of the fifty monks became slack beyond ordinary standards of medieval slackness. This group of disreputable companions would eventually include Richard of Pudlicott, who Doherty describes as a former merchant and a charming, dissolute rogue with a grudge against the king. Pudlicott had made a living, Tout explains, as a wandering trader in wool, cheese, and butter. He had been in Flanders trading wool. Edward had allied with Flanders against France in a campaign in 1297 that had turned out to be disastrous. When Edward left Flanders, he left behind a great deal of debt. Seeking to ensure that the king would pay his debt, Flemish authorities arrested several English merchants, held them as hostages. Tout writes, Edward's credit was so bad that we can hardly blame the Flemings for leaving no stone unturned to obtain payment of their debts. Pudlicott was among those arrested, and while he managed to escape and return back to London, he had to leave his property behind, a problem which he apparently blamed on Edward I. Tout writes, like many bankrupts, he seemed to have generally had enough money to indulge in all the personal gratifications that he had a special mind to practice. It seems that in the pursuit of his disreputable pleasures, Pudlicott was brought into contact with John Sench. William of the Palace and the other merrymakers lay an ecclesiastical in the lodge of the King's Palace of Westminster. The proximity of the abbey to the palace allowed him access there as well, where, Tout suggests, he was impressed that the monks were served on silver plates, something which he surmised he might acquire as a way to reimburse himself for the debts he felt were owed to him by the king. Tout writes that Pudlicott simply found a ladder, climbed through a window, thence he made his way to the refectory and secured a rich booty of plate which he managed to carry off and sell. But Pudlicott's lifestyle meant that the proceeds from the plates did not serve his needs for long, and, Tout writes, by the end of 1302, Richard was again destitute and looking out for something to steal. And steal he would. Pike writes that on the 26th of April in succeeding days, great numbers of precious stones and all kinds of gold work and silver work were offered to sale to the goldsmiths of London and bought by them with a readiness which did them no credit. A rumor soon traveled from mouth to mouth that the royal treasury, which was within the abbey but close to the palace of Westminster, had been entered and robbed. The Stoke-on-Trent Evening Sentinel wrote in 1957, The city goldsmith rubbed his chin and turned the gold goblet over in his hands. If he wondered how the seller had come by it, he asked no questions. In the spring of 1303, transactions of the same kind were being made all over London. It seemed as if a shower of treasure had fallen upon the town, but most people shrugged the matter off as being... No business of theirs. But it was very much the business of crown officials when it was discovered that the royal regalia stored in Westminster Abbey had been robbed to the tune of a hundred thousand pounds or more. Pike writes, it's not easy to state the modern equivalent of such a sum, but materials for an estimate might be found in the fact that the whole revenue of the kingdom amounted to no more than 40,000 pounds about 30 years prior to the robbery. When the news was taken to the king, Doherty writes that the crime was so brazen that the king's first reaction was probably to dismiss such reports as nonsense. In Edward I's mind, Doherty writes, theft from him was synonymous with treason, and someone would have to pay. Pike writes that the king established a commission of inquiry. The commission consisted of juries, representing all the wards of London, as well as a jury of goldsmiths and aldermen, whose job it was to collect and review evidence. The website of English Heritage writes that immediately after the shocking theft of much of this treasure, suspicion fell on the abbot and monks, who consequently were all briefly imprisoned in the Tower of London. The Evening Sentinel writes that soon the prisons were full. The alleged culprits included the abbot, 
and the sacrist, several monks and lay brethren, city merchants and women of the town, a diverse hall, each protesting their innocence. And it wasn't long before the hall included Richard, a pudlicot. For being such a fantastic crime, it wasn't difficult to determine the culprit. Pudlicott, who was arrested with nearly 2,000 pounds of booty on him, confessed. How had he managed to rob the most secure vault in the realm? How it explains the story from Pudlicott's confession. Having resolved to rob the treasury, came to the conclusion that the best way to tackle the business was to pierce a hole through the wall of 13 feet of stone that supported the tower story of the chapter house. To do so, Pudlicott sowed some hempweed in front of a window to obscure the view and, during the dark nights of winter and spring, drilled through the solid masonry. He worked on the hole until a fortnight after Easter, and on the night of Wednesday, the eve of St. Mark, he got into the treasury, stayed inside through St. Mark's Day, sorting out the things he wanted to carry off, and on the following night he got out, leaving part of the treasure underneath the bush to recover it the next night. In his confession, Pudlicott refused to name any accomplices. Doubt writes, such is Pudlicott's story. It is the tale of a bold ruffian who glories in his crime and is proud to declare, I alone did it. That story was not quite believable. Pike writes that it's quite evident that a procedure which required more than four months for its accomplishment could not have been successful had there been no collusion within the Abbey Gates. The findings of the various juries pointed to a deep-laid conspiracy between some persons in the Abbey and others in the neighboring palace. Tout writes that he has no doubt that he must have had accomplices both inside and to whom he could hand out the contents. Most of the stolen items were quickly recovered. Some were found in odd places, like laying in ditches or caught in fishermen's nets. The official William of the Castle and four other lay people were convicted and hanged, although it isn't clear whether they were hanged for the crime itself or for dereliction of duty. Ten monks were also arrested and held in the tower for two years, but Edward eventually released them, apparently because he didn't want more trouble with the church. And the guy that was in charge of it all, the keeper of the castle, Sench, was given his hereditary job back. History Things calls Richard of Pudlicott the dumbest criminal of the 1300s, noting that he had plenty of money to get away, but instead he just hung around London waiting to get caught. But Tout says that there was a a touch of heroism and of devotion in our hero thus taking upon himself the whole blame. But Richard was made an example of. He was not just hanged, but he was flayed, and his skin was, according to legend, nailed to the door of the treasury to deter other thieves, although that story turns out to be apparently apocryphal. Paul Doherty writes that the crypt and the chapel of Picts were never again used to store royal treasure, and that they fell into disuse, and that Pudlicott and the robbery were forgotten. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy, and if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. 